tonight on News Center. As the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit comes to a close in Manila, we're learning that South Korea will host the APEC Leader Summit for the second time in 2025. Developing story Belgian authorities conduct raids around Brussels in relation to Paris attacks. French investigators try to determine the fate of suspected ringleader and a warning from the French PM. ISIS might use chemical or biological weapons. We have the latest. Heaven and Earth condemn ISIS. Beijing vows to bring ISIS to justice after the group said it had executed two hostages, a Chinese and a Norwegian. And following an agreement among G20 leaders to tackle tax evasion by multinational corporations, Korea, too, has come up with measures to implement what's called a Google tax. We'll take an in-depth look. It's Thursday, November 19, 2015. We want to welcome our viewers in Korea and all around the world. This is News Center. I'm Moon Gon Young. In Manila, the Philippines, the two-day APEC summit came to an end just a few hours ago. We go live to our presidential office correspondent, Hwang Sung-hee, in Manila. Uh, Sung-hee, the latest coming out from there, Korea will host the APEC Leaders Summit in 2025. That's right, Kanyang. Wrapping up the two-day event, Korea announced that it will play host to the APEC Summit in 2025. Now, that would be the second time for the country to host the event since the APEC Summit was held in the country's southeastern port city of Busan 10 years ago. But as was the G20 Summit in Turkey last weekend, this year's APEC Summit was largely overshadowed by the recent terror attacks in Paris. President Park and other Asia-Pacific leaders strongly denounced terrorism through a joint declaration following their two-day summit. Referring to the terrorist attacks in Paris, Beirut, and against Russian aircraft over Sinai, the 21 APEC leaders said they strongly condemn all acts, methods, and practices of terrorism. They went on to stress the urgent need for increased international cooperation and solidarity in the fight against terrorism. The leader said they will not allow terrorism to threaten the fundamental values that underpin free and open economies. In one voice, they said that economic growth and prosperity are the most powerful tools to address the root causes of terrorism. By including the determination to counter terrorism in the opening statement, the declaration reflects that terrorism is not only a political issue, but also one of the biggest hurdles for economic prosperity that urgently requires the leader's collective action. The APEC Summit is one of the best-known annual forums on economic issues in the region. But this year's summit was largely overshadowed by the issue of terrorism, as it came less than a week after the deadly terror attacks in Paris. On the economic front, the leaders noted the importance of enabling full participation of all sectors of society, especially women, youth and small and mid-sized businesses, to achieve inclusive growth. Now President Park will fly to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia tomorrow morning as the final stop in her three-nation tour. There she is set to attend the ASEAN Plus 3 Summit, the East Asia Summit and the Korea ASEAN Summit. Kan Young? Hwang Sung Hee uh, in Manila traveling with the President. Thank you for that. Inclusive growth was the key word at the APEC Summit this year. The Korean president proposed ways for the APEC members to support each country's small and medium-sized enterprises go beyond their borders. Our Connie Kim reports, Seoul remains committed to a regional economic integration. Internationalization of small and mid-sized enterprises is what President Park Geun-hye proposed as she called for inclusive growth in the Asia-Pacific economic integration. This means SMEs that account for 97 percent of total companies in the region will go beyond domestic sales and ship their products and services overseas, ultimately fostering economic integration. President Park called for APEC member nations to support their SMEs so they can expand and grow beyond borders. President Park also stressed the need for boosting competitiveness in the service industry, introducing Korea's deregulation efforts in the sector. That's why she proposed a project to analyze regulations and service industries across the region. 
stressing the need to accelerate efforts for regional economic integration. President Park reaffirmed Korea's willingness to push forward with the implementation of the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. The China led FTAAP is supported by the 21 APEC member nations. If the pact comes into effect, it'll be one of the largest FTAs in the world, covering more than half of the global economy and trade. Connie Kim, Arirang News. For an assessment of the Korean president's achievements at the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit in Manila, we're joined live in the studio by Dr. Yang Jun Suk, professor of economics at the Catholic University of Korea. Dr. Yang, good to see you again. Happy to be here. Uh, let me first ask you about your overall impression about the uh, joint statement. Okay, well, it's not different from the joint statements that they have other years. APEC actually covers a very wide area of interest. So what the uh, leader's statement tries to do is to hit on as many of them as possible and then try to emphasize what the, uh, they want to do for the next year in all of these areas. As a result of that, it's a very wide-ranging document. It has a little bit of everything. Uh, so, and this year, it wasn't that different. Uh, what is though uh, noteworthy here is that, uh, well, because of the Paris terrorism incident, they did start off with a condemnation of terrorism. And then they have what they have every year, which is to try to get the WTO Doha round started again. Uh, but I note that they didn't come up with any concrete initiatives. Uh, so that tells you that it's something that they just say every year. Uh, and then some is a lot of issues here. Uh, some of them, I think, were emphasized because Philippines wanted to emphasize them. The host uh, country. Yes. And they have things like financial cooperation, which includes Cebu Action Plan. Mm. So uh, uh, that's why you want to become a host country, so that you can try to emphasize issues that matter to you. Well, Korea gets to emphasize uh, the issues that matters to Korea once again in 2025. Right. Uh, and you can sort of see why, uh, how popular this event is because they're planning 10 years ahead. Right. Uh, and what, they, what this type of leaders meeting allows you to do is to have a personal contact uh, with the uh, leaders of the major countries in your country so they can actually see the, and get interest on your country's situation. So that's why Korea or other countries are so keen to try to host this event. Right. So would you say that President Park's role at the APEC summit in Manila this time around was to, uh, I guess, win endorsements from other countries to, for Korea to host this summit in 2025? Uh, partially. Uh, I think uh, what, we, what Korea tries to do, like every other APEC member country, is to try to get more emphasis on issues that interest Korea. And this time around, it was inclusive growth. It was small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, it was uh, market opening through uh, measures like FTA. So uh, in that sense, she was very successful. But on the other hand, I think she uh, did not want to uh, take too much of the limelight this time. So she came with a very wide-ranging agenda. Well, many of the members of various multilateral free trade agreements were present at the APEC summit, uh, the U.S.-led TPP, the China-led RCEP. And um, how would those have impact on the APEC-driven FTAP, the uh, free trade agreement of the Asia-Pacific? So many multilateral deals. Okay, well, it was interesting that they actually included a statement saying that they uh, were very happy that TPP was more or less completed, and they encouraged RCEP to uh, proceed faster. So they're standing behind both of them with the recognition that once those two are over, then they're, they're going to be the building blocks for FTOP. Uh, so I think this reaffirms their commitment to, to uh, market liberalization, which is actually one of the two reasons why APEC was created in the first place. Mm -hmm. The two reasons were market liberalization in services and goods uh, exports and uh, in international investment and capacity building, helping each other. So uh, having this emphasis on market liberalization is natural for them. Right, and it seems to have hit all those points, the right points, although albeit at a very average level, but it did hit all those points. Right, uh, so that's what APEC is supposed to do, that's what the leaders meeting is supposed to do. It's supposed to reaffirm what the APEC is doing and try to give a nudge to a certain directions that you want it to go, the leaders as well as the host country. All right, Dr. Yang Jinsa, Professor of Economics at the Catholic University of Korea, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us this evening. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me.
Now, shifting gears, China, a country that has largely stayed out of matters concerning the militant group ISIS, has strongly condemned its killing of one of its citizens. Our Kim ji reports. China has vowed to bring to justice those responsible for executing a citizen held hostage by the Islamic State militant group, or ISIS. China's foreign ministry on Thursday confirmed the man's identity as Han Jinghui, who was held captive by ISIS in September. The militant group previously identified him as a 50-year-old freelance consultant from Beijing. It's unclear why he went to the Middle East. The ministry said the government had tried to rescue Pan by activating an emergency mechanism. Chinese media reports said President Xi Jinping, who was in Manila for the APEC summit, strongly condemned the killing. The ministry said it will strengthen the country's anti-terrorism cooperation with the international community to bring criminals to justice. Up until now, China had been reluctant to get involved in destroying military targets in Syria and Iraq, where the group largely operates. News of the execution comes as world powers scramble to figure out how to defeat the terrorist group. Russia submitted a revised UN resolution on fighting the Islamic State Wednesday, two months after a previous version was rejected. Pan Jinghui is the first and so far only known Chinese citizen that has been held hostage by ISIS. Pictures of him and a Norwegian captive were published in the group's online magazine Dabik Wednesday under the headline Executed. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. We've been learning of new details emerging in Paris, in Brussels, in New York, all over the world. Details related to the terrorist group responsible over Friday's attacks in Paris. But first, it's breaking news. Authorities in France are reporting that the mastermind behind the Paris terrorist attacks on Friday is now dead. Bruce Harrison joins me live in the studio. Uh, Bruce, so after a period of uncertainty after waiting for the DNA test results, we now have confirmation that the man who orchestrated Friday's attacks is now killed. That's correct, Hyun Young. A French authorities say a DNA test confirmed that a body pulled from rubble of a building near Paris is that of Abdel Hamid Aboud. Uh, police, like you said, were initially unsure if his body was one of two found after the intense assault in the suburb of Saint Denis. The 27 year old Aboud was a Belgian citizen. Police arrested eight people during the seven hour raid, which a prosecutor described as incredibly dangerous. The raid was extremely difficult. The security door held up for the first round of explosives, which allowed the terrorists to prepare the retaliation, prolific fire that was nearly uninterrupted for nearly an hour. Only well, says police shot nearly 5,000 bullets during that raid. The Telegraph reports DNA attests did in fact confirm Aboud was the one who was killed during that raid. Right, Bruce, so uh, he was a Belgian citizen as well, and there are very ongoing operations, raids uh, across the Belgian capital of Brussels today, right now, as we speak. What's the process there? That's right. Belgian authorities say that police have been conducting raids all day in Brussels, in particular the neighborhood of Molenbeek. Uh, they're looking there specifically because uh, two people connected to the raids lived in that uh, impoverished neighborhood, and while new raids were just beginning on on Thursday, uh, Belgium's Prime Minister Charles Michel promised a larger budget next year to boost security to fight terrorism. Preventing young people from leaving for combat or training zones is not enough. We must also prevent those who are not Belgian from returning to our territory. And for us, the rule must be clear. Jihadists who come back must be sent to prison. Michel also told lawmakers laws would be created to make it impossible to buy prepaid mobile phone cards anonymously and enable police to carry out home searches any time of day. Bruce, um, ISIS has made uh, further threats to different cities, different countries all across the world in, in a very bold move, I would say. How are these countries dealing with these threats? It's uh, 
natural for ISIS to do is they've been known to make very brash statements. Uh, some of the latest uh, were targeting countries that have been carrying out airstrikes, particularly the United States, France, Russia, and ISIS said it quickly after the attacks these countries would would suffer uh, for doing that. Uh, and most recently, ISIS released a video that was just Wednesday suggesting New York City would be a potential target of attacks. Uh, but New York Mayor Bill de Blasio says, in his own words, there's no specific or credible threat against the Big Apple. And many countries are working on ways of uh, anti terrorism measures, counterterrorism measures uh, for, I guess, against this kind of threat, including Korea. Right here in Korea, um, the lawmakers have been talking this week about how to boost security. It's going to include more funding. Uh, and just this week, uh, Korean authorities arrested an illegal immigrant who may have ties to a foreign terrorist organization. Right, and the Seoul government has issued a travel warning to Paris and France. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. And also, um, you know, keep in mind that we're learning that the network of terrorists behind the Friday's attacks are, is much bigger than we had imagined. So it's something that we really need to keep an eye on and uh, look at the developments. ISIS has terror cells in a number of countries, and that's been confirmed. So, yeah. All right, Bruce, thank you so much for that. As we learn more about the terrorist attack in Paris last week and uh, that this terrorist network is bigger than anyone had imagined, there is growing anxiety felt across here in Korea as well. Uh, uh, this country has been deemed one of the safest places in the world for its low crime rate, but is it safe from terrorist attacks? What do experts think and how does the public feel? Arirang News, Kwon Soa. France. Russia and Lebanon have all been hit by major terrorist attacks in the last three weeks and all have been claimed by the militant group calling itself Islamic State. With ISIS threatening more attacks, people across the world have begun to say they don't feel safe in public anymore. But what about Korea? It was recently ranked as the safest of 120 countries, jumping from ninth last year. But experts say that's got more to do with the country's low crime rate and domestic safety policies, gun possession rules, for example, and that while South Korea puts a lot of time and effort into preventing attacks from North Korea, when it comes to dealing with terrorist groups like ISIS, it's very inexperienced. The seriousness and fear of terrorism seems to be even spreading into this country. As many citizens I talked to here in the capital, Seoul, believe there is a chance of terror attacks here in Korea. Many countries have been attacked and it's hard to know whether we'll be spared, and I'm afraid. With globalization and the freedom to travel, everyone can come and go as they please. I'm worried that Korea's security isn't strong enough. Those concerns are growing. An illegal immigrant was arrested on Wednesday for suspected ties to a terrorist group. And last month, the National Intelligence Service reported a possible threat from ISIS on the COEX complex in southern Seoul. ISIS is expanding its power uh, beyond their main strongholds of Iraq and Syria to North Africa, Europe and Asia. On uh, the recent 11th issue of Tabiq, which is ISIS propaganda magazine, they listed up Japan and Korea. So how prepared would Korea be in a case of an attack? We South Koreans do not have specific law to regulate terrorist attack or how to respond when terror occurs. So that implies if terror occurs, we have no controlling uh, uh, body. Each branch has to uh, respond respectively. From the terrorist point of view, they try to coordinate and they uh, you know, attack simultaneously. So it's very urgent for a Korean politician to pass the specific law. Experts are also concerned that the rising anxiety could result in unnecessary prejudice against the growing Muslim population. And many say that an analytical approach to ISIS is needed more than ever before. Konsua. Arirang News. As our Kwon Soa just mentioned, uh, concerns over biased views against people of the Islamic faith continues to grow in Korea, especially since a man suspected to have links with a terrorist group was arrested yesterday. 
Our Shin Seiman tells us more about uh, the increasing prejudice against Muslim people and what experts recommend uh, regarding this issue. A 32-year-old man of Indonesian nationality residing in Chungcheongnamdo province has been arrested. His charges? Violating immigration control law and forging documents. He's also suspected of supporting the Syrian branch of al-Qaeda. He was found to have uploaded a video clip of himself waving the terrorist group's flag at a local mountain back in April. Korea's National Intelligence Service says a total of 48 foreigners suspected of having links with terrorist organizations have been deported since 2010. Moreover, 10 Korean nationals were also found publicly supporting the Islamic State militant group online. Such instances are contributing to build up concerns and tension over anti-foreigner, anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim sentiments rooting in the country. The recent string of terror attacks has certain communities around the world worried, worried that it may make them targets of backlash and discrimination for their religious beliefs. Yeah, I'm kind of a bit worried about that because it's something difficult to Muslim to face because it's linked IS and Muslim, but it's a difference. Currently, over 130,000 Muslims are living in Korea, and they are jittered about media outlets' descriptions of the ISIS terror group, leading to misconceptions from other people that terrorism is part of their religion. I think it's, it's a very small group of which is so-called fanatics on that, which I, used to, I believe that is, that's also wrong in terms of we are talking, if we are talking about religion, especially Muslim. Experts say that education is crucial, especially when it comes to break down the biased idea that Islamic countries are fostering terrorist groups. It's a matter of perspective. The way we view people that are different from us should change. While concerns over worldwide terrorism activities continue to grow by the day, experts say that considering terrorists and Muslims as being the same must be stopped, and that the best way to narrow the gap of misunderstanding is by working together. Shin Semin, Arirang News. Of its ruling workers. Camera filming me. Although I'm filming the me. Finally, at a cabinet. Events. Same title. Both I think the one week. The resistance from the visitors. Will he or won't he? That's been going on for a few days now. The United Nations has finally confirmed that uh, arrangements are underway for UN Secretary General Pan Ki moon to travel to Pyongyang sometime in the near future. What does this mean and what changes will the UN chief's visit to North Korea bring about? Adirang News Foreign Affairs correspondent Song ji -san. UN Secretary General Pan Ki moon is heading to Pyongyang with just the dates yet to be fixed. The UN has confirmed that discussions are underway for a bond to visit Pyongyang, although the visit won't take place this week or next, as early reports had suggested, as his agenda is already full until next week. If Pan ends up traveling to Pyongyang, he will likely hold talks with Kim Jong-un on the regime's nuclear program and human rights issues. The question is what kind of progress the two can make if and when they meet. Experts speculate the regime would use this opportunity to tout improvements to its human rights record and make an appeal for sanctions relief. They say the meeting would also present the North Korean leader with a chance to cement his leadership ahead of a major gathering of ruling workers' parties for May 2016. In addition to seeking to re-establish relations with China, Kim will seek to exhibit how stable Pyongyang's political system is, as well as tout its human rights situation to the world. There's a chance the trip's happening because Kim has invited Bon. But whether the U.N. chief's visit will happen this year is still up for debate. With the world's attention focused on fighting terrorism in the wake of recent attacks in Paris and elsewhere, some speculate that Ban's trip could be put off until next year. Song Ji-san, Arirang News. 
Korea has unveiled a plan to build a new highway linking the nation's capital of Seoul to the country's administrative capital, Sejong, by year 2025. The over $5.7 billion project will not only cut travel time by more than half an hour, but it will be a high-tech roadway equipped with road systems for driverless cars and smart tolls. Our EG1 reports. The highway will start on the outskirts of Seoul and end at Sejong for a total distance of 129 kilometers. The Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport announced its plans on Thursday, saying the project will be carried out in two phases. The first phase, which starts next year and ends in 2022, involves construction of the segment from Seoul to Ansong. Construction on the other segment, from Ansong to Sejong, will start in 2020, and the highway will open in 2025. The new expressway is expected to cut the travel time between Seoul and Sejong, home to 36 government agencies, from an hour and a half to 70 minutes. When completed, traffic on the crowded Gyeongbu and Jungbu expressways connecting the southern and northern parts of South Korea will be reduced by roughly 60 percent. And according to the government, the benefits don't end there. We expect a variety of benefits, including a savings of about 170 million U.S. dollars a year from the shorter travel time, lower operating costs and fewer environmental costs. In addition, about 66,000 new jobs will be created. The project is expected to cost 5.7 billion U.S. dollars and will be financed with both public and private funds. The government will pay about $1.2 billion for the cost of the land and will enlist private corporations to cover the rest. EG1, Arirang News. Earlier this week, the G20 leaders approved a set of joint guidelines to crack down tax dodging activities by multinational corporations. President Park Geun-hye also showed support for this so-called Google tax, saying that Korea will share its experience so that developing economies can actively join in this move. For more on this tax scheme, we are joined live by our Hwang Ji-hye in the studio. Ji-hye, uh, first walk us through this agreement reached among the G20 leaders now um, in tackling this, I guess, combination of clever accounting and uh, using tax havens. So what the G20 member countries agreed on is tackling multinational corporations, especially IT companies like Facebook and Google, trying to move their profits out from a certain country to avoid paying taxes. It's easier for technology companies to move their headquarters and divert profits because their operations are mostly digitalized, meaning that their physical locations do not really have a major impact on their sales. And that's why the tax scheme is, while the tax scheme is officially known as the diverted profits tax, is also known as the Google tax, as you just said. Right. Um, this tax avoidance issue must be getting out of hand, you know, CEOs jokingly say if you want to cut your tax bills, you become a multinational company. Um, so how serious is this? Well, global companies have been under criticism over tax evading activities for years. And according to the OECD data, the losses in tax revenue through corporate practices are estimated at 100 billion to 240 billion U.S. dollars a year. And that accounts for up to 10 percent of all corporate tax revenue across countries. Korea is, of course, no exception. More than half of foreign firms operating in the country have not paid a single penny in corporate taxes. Well, with this uh, G20 leaders agreeing on an international deal to once and for all settle this issue of tax avoidance, uh, what is Korea doing to implement this? Well, each G20 government, including Korea, will have to go through the legitimizing process to take uh, the measures into action. Korea's finance ministry says it's already taking steps to implement the measures and that it plans to revise the corporate tax and income tax law after 2017. But in the process, Professor uh, An Chang Nam that I spoke to at Gangnam Nam University says that it's important to look ahead as Korea's IT companies are likely to grow as major multinational like Google. Maybe in five to ten years, Korean firms like Naver will turn into the risk of being taxed twice by the U.S. government and the government at home, while Korea taxes Google. Then, some could argue of exempting taxes in both countries. 
Nevertheless, the initiative of revising laws to clamp down tax evasion by global companies is viewed as something positive, experts say, because it's uh, taking the country's tax law to the next level um, to catch up with rapidly shifting industries. Right, and hopefully those clever accountants don't catch up with the loopholes of these systems. Thank you, Jihei. Great reporting for that. Thanks for having me. Three weeks ago, leading up to the APEC Leaders Summit, transport ministers of the 21 member economies agreed to support a task force to explore the benefits and challenges of APEC wide transport cards. That, following President Park's proposal to introduce a transportation card similar to that of Korea's one card all pass system that could be used anywhere in the APEC member economies. Our news feature tonight with Lee Soon. What I'm holding in this hand is a prepaid public transportation card, while this one here is an ordinary credit card. And with either one of them, you can ride on any bus, take the subway, and even pay for a taxi ride anywhere in the country. Over 90% of Koreans use smart transportation cards like T Money and Cash B cards. These cards have become an indispensable part of daily life. The transfer system has made it possible for me to ride on a bus and transfer onto any subway line with just one payment. Before, Seoul transportation cards were limited to Seoul only, but now you can use the cards in different regions too. Transportation cards have become must have items for foreign tourists as well. We went to Myeongdong in downtown Seoul to ask how they're liking it. Really convenient. Why? Uh, well, because you can use it in a taxi, in the bus, and in the metro, basically, everywhere. It's perfect. I used it the first time today, and it's quite easy to go in and out the subway station without having to know which ticket to buy before. Just a simple tap on the machine's sensor pad with the card will let you pay automatically. Then the machine saves your location and time on the database, letting you transfer for free as long as you transfer within 30 minutes while traveling within 10 kilometers. You can even use it to buy things in stores, markets, and vending machines as long as they're equipped with the transit card readers. What's more, transportation cards can be registered in an Android smartphone or smartwatch, making it even easier and faster to pay for fees. On top of making everyday life easier, smart cards are seen as a driving force behind the development of Korea's transportation system. Through compiling big data with a smart car system, operators can analyze various traffic patterns such as how and where people move around the most. This contributes to a more effective management of bus and subway schedules. Last year in June, the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport launched the so-called One Card All Pass, a new transportation card that can be used in any region of the country, as opposed to just around Seoul or just in Busan. Since its launch, the number of users has been on the rise, with more than 4 million cards sold in just the month of December last year, and usage amounted to over 24 million, a 215 percent spike since July of that year. But it wasn't all so smooth from the beginning. There was demand for a connected transfer system. That clashed with some card companies who had their own interests at stake. But in the end, we were able to implement a transfer system through collaborative decision-making. In Mongolia's capital, Ulaanbaatar, Korea's transportation card machines are everywhere to be found. The Korean T-Money system was implemented in the Central Asian country in July 2014. And in just two months, the number of smart card sales doubled. Among urban residents, the usage rate stands at some 40 percent. A lot of people use a smart card because it's a lot faster and simpler compared to paying cash to ride on buses. With Mongolia being the latest importer, the Netherlands, Malaysia and Colombia are already using Korea's smart card system. Earlier in the year in May, at the APEC Working Level meeting in Busan, Korea's smart transportation card system was proudly introduced to international delegates, encouraging its export. 
And now, with the wake of the APEC summit, the Korean government seeks to lead the way in implementing Asia One Pass, a transportation card system that will allow users to move around any city or country in Asia with just one card. Lee Soo-in, Arirang News. Well, it was another gray day here in Seoul today, and um, I'm not one to complain, not a fan of uh, sunny weather, but let's check with our E. Jihan at the Weather Center for more details. Jihan. Hello, Ganyang. It rained nine days so far this month, meaning that it practically rained almost every other day. In fact, it's going to rain again later tonight. Well, I guess that's good news because the country has been suffering from a severe right. drought. But um, with this constant rain and mild temperatures, it seems like winter is never going to come. But it is on the way and in fact we will definitely experience colder winter starting from the end of the next week. The thermometer will plunge to the lower single digits, so enjoy the mild weather while it's here. And as I said, it will rain overnight for most parts of the peninsula, but it's going to be very spotty with less than five millimeters of precipitation, but Jeju Island will see five to twenty millimeters of a light rainfall. And most regions will wake up to gray and partly sunny skies. Seoul will get up to eight. Daejeon and Daegu will start out the day at nine, but Busan and Jeju Island will have a relatively mild morning lows with twelve and fourteen reaching up to respectively. And the daily highs will be slightly higher than today, and skies will be brighter. As the daily high here in the capital will hike up to 13, Daejeon and Daegu will see a high of 15 and 16, and Busan and Jeju will have a mild afternoon, picking to 17 and 19. Now that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. Well, one of the gems of Korea is that we have four distinct seasons and now we're entering winter. So it will be snow-covered mountains very soon. Hope you come here and check it out yourselves. That is our broadcast on this Thursday evening. I'm Moon Gwan Young. Thank you for watching. We hope to see you right back here same time tomorrow on News Center.